Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. And if you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, it's on page 41, but towards the back, because in your pew Bibles, the New Testament starts over numbering. So again, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on them, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home saying, do not even go into the village. Here ends the reading, Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. This story is strange. If we're being really honest about it, this is the one of the weirdest healing accounts in the New Testament. First of all, it's a private healing, and we've never had that before unless you're counting the ones where Jesus was raising children from the dead and didn't want to make their families subject to the spectacle. But when Jesus has healed other blind men, and when he'll do it again, the crowd observes what's happening. So this is strange that Jesus pulls this man aside to do this healing. And also we need to ask ourselves, how exactly does Jesus' saliva get into the guy's eyes? Does Jesus spit on him? Does Jesus spit on Jesus' hands and rub them together and smack them on? It's pretty gross when you stop to think about it, really. I mean, if it was anybody but Jesus, we'd be going, ugh, right? And a healing that doesn't work at first a healing that is halfway and has to be done again. Also, a healing done with a question rather than a command. Every other one of Jesus' healings involves some other kind of command. Take up your mat and walk. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, mouth open, ears be unstopped. He speaks in this confident tone, or that's how I read it. And instead, what we get here is, can you see anything yet? Can you see anything yet? And what's this story of men walking around, but they look like trees? Does that mean that this man wasn't born blind? We know nothing about this person's backstory. And again, at the very end of the story, we have the reminder to keep it a secret, that thing that we call in the Gospel of Mark the messianic secret, the repeated refrain by Jesus, don't tell anybody what I did. And of course, no one ever listens to what Jesus says. But don't even go into the village, just go. What in the heck is happening here is what we should be asking ourselves, or it's what I ask myself when I get to this story. Well, oftentimes it's helpful when we have these questions, what is happening here, to take a step back and to look at the context of the story. We're in the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters long. So we're about halfway through the book, and in any other literary context, you'd be like, well, we're about halfway through Jesus' earthly ministry, but you would be wrong in this case. The Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters long. Jesus' earthly ministry is three years long. And like most Gospels, the majority of Mark's writing is dedicated to the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, the last week of three years of work. Jesus has already turned his eyes to Jerusalem. In Mark 11, you would read about Palm Sunday. In Mark 14, you would read about Monday, Thursday. In Mark 15, you would get the crucifixion. And Mark 16 is the resurrection. The last week gets most of the time. So we can guess that at this moment, at this moment, we're headed, Jesus already knows what's coming. Zoom in on the context just a little bit closer. Look at chapter 8. In the five verses before this, in verse 17 through 21, Jesus asks eight questions to his disciples. Eight questions in just those five verses. Here they are. 
Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? And then he talks about the two he does that are recorded in the gospel of Mark, the feeding of the 5,000, which we've talked about. And Mark also has a feeding of a 4,000. And then he says, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And he asked that twice. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect after each feeding? And the last question is, do you not yet understand? So the five verses before this story set us up for a Jesus who is maybe frustrated. What if in this miracle story, what if Jesus is exhausted? What if he's just at the end of his rope? What if Jesus is scared? Jesus coming to the end of his earthly ministry, knowing what's about to happen. What if Jesus is just scared? Now, this is biblical, right? Because when you read some of these gospel accounts, when it, on Mon what we celebrate as Monday, Thursday, Jesus has had a meal with his followers, and then they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and some gospels tell us that he was agitated. Some gospels tell us that he asked God to let the cup pass away from him. Some gospels tell us that he was so agitated and stressed out that his sweat becomes like blood. What if, in the moment of this miracle, Jesus is already scared? is already anticipating what's coming next. The context of this story is that the time for miracles and teaching about the kingdom of God is passing. And the time for Christ's ultimate work is beginning. The focus of Jesus is shifting from what he has been doing for the last two and a half two and three quarters years to what he must do on the cross, what ultimately he came here to do. And while he's shifting his focus to the cross, I can't help but wonder if he realizes that the disciples don't get it yet. They don't get it. Imagine that pressure. You have been teaching and working with these disciples and apostles who are supposed to take over the mission when you leave and you're getting really close to the end of your time and you're utterly convinced that no one around you has understood what you're even about yet. Now, if you want to get into the super nerdy stuff with me, maybe you've heard me say this before. Christ in God is outside of time which means Christ outside of time would have known exactly how his earthly life was going to go before the incarnation. He would be able to see every moment all together. He knows how this all goes down. He knows what's going to happen in this moment. But the, but the piece that we're talking about today is Jesus. Jesus bound by time, bound by linear time as a human. Jesus who's experienced growing up and teaching and working with people for three years. Maybe this Jesus is trying to get ready not only for the physical agony that his body is going to experience, but the emotional agony of betrayal and denial and abandonment. How do the disciples not get it yet. How is it possible that they've been with him this whole time and they still don't understand what he's about? Immediately following the healing that we just read about, the healing at Bethesda of the blind man, Jesus has an exchange with his disciples. He asks yet another question, who do you say that I am? And that Peter in a moment of epiphany, says, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus proceeds to tell them about how this Messiah is going to be killed by the empire. And Peter goes, no, that cannot be true. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right after this healing miracle, after this 
rant of questions at the disciples and then this healing miracle that happens with a question and has to be done twice. We have the next moment where Peter gets it right and declares Jesus the Messiah and then he totally misses it. He understands what Jesus' identity is but then completely misses the mark about the work Jesus is about to do. But honestly, if we're being really honest and grace-filled, It's really not Peter and the disciples' fault that they can't see what's happening. Much like it's not really the fault of the blind man that he is blind or that his first healing causes him to see tree-like people. Because the truth is that true seeing, true comprehending, true understanding is hard. Think about physical eyesight for a second. Even those who could claim 2020 vision at one point in time in their lives have had the experience of being able to literally see something. Have you missed something while you've been searching for it, only to have your partner show up and lift it up from right in front of you and say, right? It's a really good feeling, isn't it? When they do that, but we've all done it. We've all missed things. And even those of us with eyes that work, maybe not 20-20, but still work relatively well, we know that it's temporary because we go to the eye doctor and every year the eye doctor tells us, you're getting older. Your vision's going to change. Even those of us with great emotional awareness, those of us who've been trained to see people, to be aware of people, to have compassion and empathy, those of us who spend our lives looking at other people and looking for justice and flourishing in the world, even we have blind spots where we miss it. It's almost impossible for a human being to really see the world and other humans the way God sees, the way Jesus sees especially through our own effort. Paul talks about that in that very popular chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. There's a whole lot of things about love in there that we generally focus on, but he has this line of seeing in a mirror dimly and then being able to see and be known even as, or to know even as he is fully known. It is hard to see while we're here on earth, and all of us are affected by some kind of, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. So where does our healing come from? Where does our sight come from? AJ, the author of our study, AJ Levine, Levine, has this to say. Jesus' initial touch, his first relations with the disciples, sparkled with the miraculous. I love that phrase, by the way, sparkled with the miraculous. It adds to the whole concept that Jesus and the disciples are like a touring rock show and everyone's just drawn to it for the visuals that's happening, right? Jesus' initial touch, his first relations with the disciples sparkled with the miraculous. The second touch, in order to get them to see clearly, concerns the cross. Look again, says Mark, I'm about to change your perception of everything. Can you see anything yet, asks Jesus. And the answer is we'll never have perfect vision until we encounter the cross, not just know about its reality, but encounter it until we really allow the truth of the work of Jesus to touch us. And we keep asking for more of that touch until we're convinced that we see clearly, or we just keep asking for it if we're humble enough to recognize we'll never see as clearly as we want to. That's the lesson from the blind man, right? We don't have to stop at asking for just once. We don't have to settle for halfway. We can tell Jesus what we're seeing and what we think we're missing, and maybe it's not right. We don't have to settle for the perception that we have now. We can wake up every single day and ask Jesus to give us an encounter with the cross that gives us new eyes to see and new ears to hear and new hearts to understand and new wills to do the work that is before us. And what we can learn from Jesus in this miracle is the call to persevere. I know You all at some point have hit the point of exhaustion. You have nothing left. 
to offer. Or maybe you've hit the point where you feel like you could do something, but you're so overwhelmed by what's coming next that you're completely distracted and paralyzed by it. Or maybe you've hit the point of not just frustration, but anger, that those around you just can't see what's happening to you. They don't understand just how bad it is in the world. They don't understand the truth of your identity. How do they keep missing it? But if the task in front of us is something we're called to do, if we persevere through all of that and accomplish our task, Jesus reminds us that we may just add to the healing and the sight of those around us. It takes the cross to give us correct vision. Now, I don't often do this. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done something like this. But I'm feeling the tug to do this. And so um, we're going to take a moment and I'm going to offer up a prayer and you can repeat it as you feel called. Um, I'm going to have you close your eyes and bow your heads and know you're not going to have to raise your hand or this is not an altar call. Um, this is just a time for us to be in prayer. So wherever you're worshiping, unless you're driving, uh, close your eyes and bow your head. And if you're feeling like you want this cross-shaped vision, I invite you to repeat after me in your head, out loud, whatever your comfort level is, this prayer. Jesus, give me new eyes to see. Give me new ears to hear. Give me a new heart to understand. And give me a new will and the perseverance to do the work you have called me for. Amen.